Fantastic. All right, I still have a couple people dialing in right now, but it looks like most people can hear me okay. So what I'd like to do now is I'm going to be bringing in our guest speaker um, in just a minute. But just for those of you who have not met me before, my name is Catherine Korostoff, and I'm the lead instructor here at Research Rockstar where I get to lead a team of 10 folks who teach over 25 different topics, uh, covering a wide range of quantitative and qualitative research topics here at Research Rockstar. And those of you who have taken courses with me before, you know me. For those of you who may not have met me before, I just want you to know I'm not shy. I don't want you to be shy. The more questions you ask, the better. Um, so we've got a really exciting uh, bit of time here set up for you folks today, where we have a special guest lecturer I'm going to bring in her bio and introduce her, and then we're going to go ahead and get started. So excited about Margaret being here with us today is Margaret is just the ultimate qualitative research expert. Not only does she really know the theory and is somebody who really is current on theory in qualitative research methodologies, but she also has the 30 years of real world experience. So it's not just about what's academically interesting in qualitative research. She can really speak with us about what makes research work. And so I love that about her, that she has such a strong balance um, of both the theory and the practice. She's literally done thousands of qualitative research projects, folks. So this is is an awesome opportunity for you to ask questions. You've got a real expert here. I also really want to point out that Margaret's got a couple of resources. She's very generous about publishing. Uh, frankly, she has a blog called researchdesignreview.com. You can see a link to it. Here, let me just bring up my little arrow. Um, you can uh, see that it's mentioned here. Whoops. Um, and I'll bring Margaret back also. Um, it is a great blog. She covers really important topics. In fact, I was reading her blog when she was talking about the topic we're going to cover today, and that's why I invited her. I said, this is a topic I know all qualitative researchers care about, this whole issue of when we should and should not ask why, what our alternatives are, um, some of the issues we should be aware of about this very simple but important question. So Margaret, thank you so much for being here today. And with that, everybody, I'm going to bring us into the main room. And Margaret's going to share her screen here. OK, so you can't see my oh, screen. It's just refreshing. Here we go. All right. Should be, and, I hope. Yep. Up and yep, you are good to okay. go, Margaret. All set. Thanks, everybody. And again, if you have any questions, don't be shy. Ask questions in the chat window. Catherine, can you, uh, it, it looks like my webcam just uh, dropped off. Um, you can. Oh, sorry about that. No problem. Here, hold on. Is that something I need to do? Um. It's okay. It's, it's okay. You don't need to see me. Okay. I think that we're good to begin then. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, uh, thank you, Catherine, for that introduction. Um, uh, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, Catherine asked me, as she said, to make a few comments this afternoon. Um, about a, a blog post um, that I put up uh, earlier uh, this summer um, concerning the why question. And, and, and I just want to say from the get-go that, um, that the why question is something I think we all ask. I know I certainly ask it. Um, and so I'm not meaning to suggest here this, uh, today that uh, this is something that we need to just do away with. Not, a, not at all, because like I say, I, I certainly use the why question myself. Um, but, I'm, but I want to suggest here today that we need to be very careful in, in choosing to use a why question before we actually do. Um, and to understand that if we do use a why question, that we may indeed be introducing um, a bias into our qualitative data. Now, to be sure, there are, oh, well, I was saying that, you know, if you do use the why question, you just need to be very careful that there may be um, a, a chance that you're introducing bias into your qualitative data. And, and, and I was starting to say, you know, there are lots of ways that we uh, potentially in, uh, introduce bias into our qualitative data. There's lots of ways. Here are just a few. One can be simply limited resources. You know, we all work under time and budget constraints. And, um, 
uh, that may affect the scope of the research that we are able to conduct in response to the research question. It may mean, for instance, if you're doing an IDI, in-depth interviewing study, uh, could be that you are having to uh, maybe conduct a shorter interview or even conduct a shorter focus group discussion. So limited resources can introduce bias. Obviously, lack of cooperation and refusals. Now, this is true, of course, in survey research as well. Um, can introduce um, uh, potential bias in the data because there are some people, maybe a group of people, that never have an opportunity to um, be participants in our in our research. Selection bias is the same way, and selection bias can come into um, into effect in a number of ways. But if you're conducting, for instance, a mobile kind of in the moment kind of research. Uh, now, granted, uh, um, many people have mobile devices, but there may be some people who are a little uncomfortable um, using their mobile device for what you are asking them to do in your qualitative study, which would kind of exclude them from that research. And of course, online research or any text-based research, in, in, in those instances, you should always be thinking about, you know, are there literacy issues? In other words, is, and, and this will vary and depend, of course, on the population that you are um, investigating, but for any given population, it may be that literacy is an issue and maybe text-based is not the appropriate, um, the appropriate mode. Of course, the physical appearance of the researcher is always in a face-to-face -face, um, or a webcam um, study where webcams involved can be a factor. But probably the most uh, important underlying um, and impactful um, uh, uh, cause of potential bias in our qualitative data are, has to do with researcher skills. Now, researcher skills in, in, include a host of, of, um, of skills and areas of training, and, and you all know that. I have just picked out one the, uh, which has to do with rapport. Um, any of you in qualitative research um, know, I'm sure, that uh, building rapport is probably, at least on my list, it's like at the top of my list of things that I think about and consider um, in the quality of any research um, uh, study and data that I bring back to the client. Um, but the other um, aspect is has to do with questions and ineffective questions, and that's what we're going to be um, talking about briefly today. And so. Um, why is why, I guess, question uh, a, a potentially ineffective question? And, and in the article I posted on my blog, I proposed four ways that it is potentially ineffective. And, and one simply has to do with the idea that it can, the why question can evoke rationality, meaning that it can kind of immediately, now, and this is going to be different in every case in terms of the type of participants, the topic you're talking about, but it can evoke kind of this immediate reaction of, of, of being def defensive almost, or there is the participant feeling that they need to justify what they just said to you. So for instance, if you were doing a healthcare study and someone said, one of your participants said, well, you know, I really prefer female doctors over male doctors. Now, if you ask why, um, that uh, is, is, is a question that may not be at all appropriate because there may not be a rational reason why someone prefers a female doctor over a male doctor. But in, in any event, the participant feels obligated to search for meaning, to search for a response to you, the researcher, that is somehow going to make sense. And unfortunately, this can encourage social desirability responding. So social desirability responding is when a participant, and of course this is very true in survey research as well, a respondent, will over-report positive aspects of something um, while under-reporting negative aspects of something. Um, and this can be particularly true when we get into the topics of religion or politics or something to do with the family um, or even nutrition and healthcare, which I'm, I'll talk a little bit more in a minute. So 
So this urge to be rational at the same time can stifle conversations. And believe me, conversations is, is what qualitative research is all about. If we don't do anything else in qualitative research, it is to have conversations that really uh, get at the lived experiences of our participants around the phenomenon that we're investigating. Um, I have found that um, and, and, and the stifling, we're stifling conversations because of this search for a rational response and they have to try to explain it and that kind of thing. You know, one example of it, and there's, and this is true, I would say a kind of a, a, across the board, but what comes to my mind when I think about stifling conversations is employee research. I've done quite a bit of corporate employee research, um, uh, both quantitative, but particularly in the qualitative area where we've done IDIs as well as uh, focus group discussions. Now, it is um, not unusual for employees to walk into a focus group discussion. And by the way, when I do, when I do employ focus group discussions, I'm always doing them off campus, um, never within the confines of the corporate environment, of course, but, but at an outside independent facility. And when employees walk into that discussion, many of them are kind of, you can see it on their faces. I mean, they're wondering, well, what's this all about? I mean, they told me the purpose, but but really, what is all this about? And does this have something to do with my job? And am I going to lose my job? And there's all kinds of uh, a certain amount of doubt and questioning. So if a participant in a discussion, and, and this, of course, has happened uh, in my work, when a, a, a participant in a discussion says something to the effect that makes me um, uh, think that they are unhappy with their work or their job or the company, whatever it is we're talking about. And if I ask, um, and I have done this in the past, I don't do it anymore. If I ask, well, why don't you like your job? Man, that just shuts everything down. There is, you could hear a pin drop in that focus group room. Because what's happening, and I, again, this is not true in all cases, but what often happens is that the employee is thinking, oh my gosh, how do I respond to that? I need to think of something that's going to be rational and make sense. But at the same time, I'm going, wow, am I going to lose my job um, based on what I say in response to that question? And so very often they'll say something back like, well, it's not that I don't like it. It's not that I don't like my job, but blah, 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 blah. So, have to be very careful about the fact that you are stifling conversations, which is the whole reason that you're doing qualitative research. A uh, third way that um, asking the why question can be ineffective is can cloud the meaning, cloud the meaning of, of what you're asking. So, so and 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 if any of you have uh, conducted IDIs or groups, you, you, you know about this. You ask a question, and you get almost a blank. I wouldn't say blank, but a questioning stare back from your participant or your participants. It's like, what did she just ask me? What is she trying to ask me? Um, and as they're searching for meaning, we have, in my mind, uh, done a very in, a grave injustice. What we have done is we have contributed to what I call participant burden. You know, in survey research, we talk about respondent burden. And I believe strongly that there is an equivalent of that in qualitative research, which I call participant burden, um, meaning that we are just asking the participant to work so hard um, to, to do one, what should be simple thing, which is to understand what we just asked them. And that's why I believe it's important to offer some context. And let me just interject here if I can. Um, I was at, uh, last week I was at Emory University having the same kind of discussion about the why question. And um, someone uh, in the audience, an attendee said to me, or asked me, I guess, well, you know, if I offer context, aren't I biasing what they're going to say back to me? And I had two responses to that. One is that in, in qualitative research, building trust and rapport um, is is kind of my is is 
so much of my goal and so much of what I'm thinking about when I conduct a qualitative study that to, to do anything that adds burden and then destroys or jeopardizes or compromises that uh, trust uh, and rapport is um, a, a non-starter with me. Uh, so participants come first for me. And secondly, I would say, and I said to her last week, is that you have to remember, this is qualitative research. This is not quantitative research. We're not asking a question and moving on to the next question. We are asking a question. And, and if we offer context, it makes it easier for them to answer. But then we, as qualitative research, have the opportunity to really follow up on that, to explore that, to really get into whatever that response was. Um, so I think it's important to add context. So uh, as a brief example, um, uh, year, some years ago, I conducted an ethnographic study. I was doing um, observations of customers at stores like Walmart, Kohl's, stores of that, retailers of that nature, um, customers who were shopping for coffee makers. And I was doing some observations as well as some interviews with a few of those customers. And I was asking, among other things, about you know what are the important factors that you think about in making a decision about coffee makers? And as you might guess, um, and is true, I think, in so much of the research we do, um, uh, a number of these participants responded with price. Well, you know, price is what I think is most important. Now, I have made the mistake in the past of asking something like, well, why is price the most important factor? And once again, <laughs> I have gotten that look I have seen too often, which is, what is she asking me? Um, what do you mean, why is price the most factor? Is she asking me about my, my socioeconomic status? Is she, is she not getting that, well, everybody worries about price, don't they? I mean, isn't, isn't that, wouldn't that be the answer, always be the answer for what is the most important factor is price? Um, so uh, I've learned uh, not to do that anymore. Um, and, and in this case, I kind of thought about it and turned it around and instead asked, so you want to buy the lowest priced coffee maker. Now, this was a great choice in the revision of the question because now the participant had something to respond to. Now they could say to me, uh, well, no, actually, I mean, yes, I want, I want a low-priced coffee maker, but it must have these features. Aha, OK, so now I could explore features, which is a great thing. So, uh, or they could simply confirm that. They could say, yes, I don't care about the features. I don't care about anything else about the coffee maker. All I care about is the low price. The fourth way that um, a why question can um, be ineffective or impact uh, the quality of the qualitative data is that um, the participant thinks we're asking a question that we don't think we're asking. We mean to ask one question, but the participant has misinterpreted or, or interprets the question differently. So an example of this, um, I do quite a bit of B2B research. Um, and uh, one of the areas I do quite a bit of work in is uh, financial services. And I have done my share of in-depth interviews with CFOs, with chief financial officers. And I was working on a study not too long ago um, interviewing CFOs at public and private universities in the US. And among other things, I was asking these CFOs about, about obviously their financial services and their financial services needs and, um, you know, and specifically, you know, again, kind of what are the most important um, financial services that a financial institution could provide you in the school? And uh, I heard a number of them uh, mention something about remote deposit. 
Um, and uh, when I uh, wrote the guide for this um, for this interview, I made sure that I didn't. Uh, so you know, now I've kind of learned my lesson, and so now I made sure that I didn't write a question like this. Why is, and in this case, why is the financial service, and in this case, remote deposit, why is remote deposit the most important service a financial institution can provide your school? And I purposely did not uh, build that into the guide or ask that in my interviews because uh, based on my experience, I was concerned that that would be interpreted as a question about how it works. So for instance, I was concerned that my participant would respond with something like, well, you know, you just take a photo of the front part of the check and then you take a photo of the back part of the check and you send it off to the bank and uh, presto, you've made a deposit. So it's fast and easy. But you know, that's not the question I wanted to, to ask. So, I changed the question to something like this. What is going on at your school that necessitates remote deposit or makes remote deposit a benefit? That is what I really, really wanted to know, is how is the financial service you just mentioned to me, in this case, remote deposit, um, a benefit to you? And I wanted them to tie it specifically back to what was going on at the school because why? Because that helps build me helps me build the story of um, what I will call their lived experience as CFO of this school, um, and helps me understand the phenomenon. Hey, Margaret, before you move on, I have a great question research. about the coffee story so, from one of our students. We have um, one of our. One of our students on the coffee story example, which I think we all really enjoyed. It's such a okay. you know, something we can all relate to. Um, the question is this, um, by asking, so you want to buy the lowest price coffee maker, is this repeating what the participant said and asking for confirmation? Um, it, could it be influencing their answer, the fact that you're repeating their answer back to them? What I'm doing is I am, they have simply, I said, what's the most important factor? They say price. That's a different comment than what I, I than what I responded back to them. What I responded back to them is is an interpretation of what they said to me. So, oh, what you're telling me is you want to buy the lowest priced coffee maker. They say, and I've had participants say, no, 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 that's not what I meant. That's not what I meant. It's an my uh, it might be my most important factor, except. You know, now that you're asking me if 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 that means to suggest to you, researcher, interviewer, moderator, that I'm only interested in buying the lowest cost coffee maker, then then that's not what I meant to say. What I meant to say, and then you get into that discussion. What I meant to say is that I don't want to spend much money on a coffee maker. Um, as long as it has, but it has to have these features. It has to have a clock. It has to have a timer. It has to have automatic shutoff. Um, oh, oh, okay. So it's not just price. Then, then you can go on with that wherever it goes, and it might be that it goes to, oh, so it's price, but it's only price in conjunction with these other features or something of that nature. Do you know what I mean? So I've, and, and, and let me say, and, and this is not what, but, you know, this may be where there's a little, um, maybe part of that question. I will, um, now this is a whole other thing I do when I do training, so we won't go into it, but let me just say, without, you know, okay, let me just say, I will paraphrase participants. Now, before you get all excited, I only do that, I only do that after I spent a great deal of time with the participant. And I have that rapport and trust. If it's not there, I never do that. But um, I try to always make sure that's there. I spent a lot of time on rapport and trust, a lot of time. 
And um, once I have that, and we are having this conversation, I um, am comfortable saying, as, as I would have said to this participant, um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit what you just said to me. Now, if I haven't done this correctly, you need to say, Margaret, you're all wet. Margaret, you're not getting it. Margaret, let me try to explain this to you again. I love it when they say that. So, um, so all of that goes into this, I think. So I'm saying, okay, I'm going to, you've just told me price is the most important factor. Well, you know what? I'm going to throw that back to you and I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. But please, if I'm not doing that correctly, you need to tell me. So are you telling me that you want to buy the lowest price coffee maker? And now they can talk to me about it. They say, oh, well, no. Right. That's not what I'm trying to say. Okay, great. No, that's so let's talk about yeah, absolutely. What you that's are fantastic as an expl ex explanation. And I, I think Does that, that the point too, especially is you know, I obviously we do get concerned, and 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 you already addressed this that sometimes by restating something, you can actually, um, you know. Uh, influence them uh, and so I love the point that you know make sure you've got a good rapport set but then of course paraphrasing can be a great way to get people to confirm that you are interpreting what they're saying correctly so once you've got a good rapport set up I certainly appreciate that as being a, an important technique so um, so you have a big thank you from our students here um, and we actually have a question on the next slide now too with the um, related to the remote deposit um, so I think one of our students was really interested right. in the after. So you went from this before question, why is remote deposit the most important? And your after question was, what's going on at your school uh, that necessitates remote deposit? Um, you know, a real, you know, I, I love that that's a great way of, of capturing that extra context, you know, because that kind of feels to me like a, a probe that I know that some people will use in similar situations, which is the, can you tell me a story about the last time you used it? Or can you tell me a story that shows me why that was important? Um, although, oops, I injected the Y word again. So did we have any other questions on that slide? <laughs> well. We all use the Y word. Well, remember that this slide has to do with um, misinterpretation. This this slide really has to has is about um, asking you, the researcher, mm. asking the question that that you really want to ask. So this is a slide about you know I didn't want to in this case I didn't want to ask the Y question because I I felt based on my experience that the participant would interpret this Y question not as a question I didn't want to ask. I didn't want to ask, I'm not asking is it fast and, and convenient to use remote deposit because frankly I know it is but that's not the question I wanted to know. What I wanted to know is the second question. So he, so in the, in the second question I'm being very, I'm trying to be very explicit. There's a lot of context there and I'm trying to be very explicit about what I am asking the participant. I'm not asking you, is it, is it this vague thing called, you know, why do you use remote deposit? I'm asking you very explicitly, what is going on at your school that necessitates and makes remote deposit a benefit? And that's an entirely different question than oh, I completely I agree. Think yes, this was hugely helpful. Thank you. I think that this will. Um, I think this Does addresses the student's question extremely well, and I love that it it gets at the why without asking the why. It doesn't in a much more context-rich sort of way, but we're still going to understand what the what the drivers are ultimately. And I and I would also say that you know going back, you know, you know these 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 four ways that I. Put in the article and I'm showing you here today, you know, that they clearly, I think you already can see that, they're not mutually exclusive, you know, they all kind of blend together. So this is, I think, this second question you see on the screen is also a good example of giving context and reducing participant burden. Because I've been very explicit about, you know, I want you to think about all the things that are going on at your school and how remote deposit um, helps you with you know different aspects of things going on at your school so um, that really gives them something I always think about it as giving participants almost like a handle 
or something to grab onto. I literally do when I when I write questions. I think, now, do I have given them something that they can grab a hold of and hold in their hand and respond to or not? And so I think this is another example where I've given them something. They know exactly what I'm asking them, and they can say, oh, yeah, OK, well, I can give you some examples of, of how it benefits us. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely, yes, so absolutely. Catherine? Oh, okay. I just didn't know if audio was... Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, so rationality, stifle conversations, questions that are ambiguous or misinterpreted, these are all ways that potentially, potentially the why question could be ineffective. I'm also now going to suggest to you that these are not just ways that that the why question can potentially be ineffective, but it can also be inefficient. And I've already alluded to this um, a bit in what I've already shown and you and talked about. It can be inefficient in getting at the whole reason for our being and why we conduct qualitative research, which is getting at the participants' lived experience and addressing the research question. Um, so here, here's an example of why it is inefficient. Another example, because I think I've already done this to some degree. So, so um, uh, a number of years ago, I was conducting focus group discussions, a focus group study with mothers with young children. And the purpose of this study was to understand what foods mothers were buying for their kids um, and, and what foods they were using in their meal preparation for their children. So we were interested in, you know, what are you shopping for, you know, how passionate are you about what you're shopping for for your kids and the meals that you prepare for them? Where do you get your information, you know, um, uh, and that kind of thing. So at, in one discussion, a mother spoke up uh, and said, well, you know what? I buy only nutritious foods for my kids. And um, I kind of made the mistake of saying, well, why is that? something to that effect, but definitely the why question. And she responded, very rational response. She said, well, we, because it's good for them. And I responded, well, why is that important? She responded, very rational response. She said, well, so they'll grow up to be big and strong. Now, where do I go from there, is anybody's guess, because frankly, I was at a dead end. I had nowhere to go with that. So, and I had nowhere to go with that conversation. And in the meantime, it wasn't it wasn't addressing my research question. It wasn't um, I wasn't learning what I needed to learn. So I wasn't getting her story. So I had to backtrack. This is why um, I talk about inefficiency as well as ineffectiveness with the why question, because now as the moderator in this case, I had to backtrack. I had to go back to her comment, I buy only nutritious foods for my kids. Instead of why, I got to what I really wanted to ask, which is, what do you mean by nutritious? I mean, clearly I needed to dig deep into this comment rather than passing it off with a why question. And uh, to start doing that, I said, well, what do you mean by nutritious? Participant says, I buy broccoli. Ah, aha, she buys broccoli. Well, that's terrific. That gave me all kinds of things uh, to ask. I buy broccoli. Now I could ask questions such as, well, what makes broccoli nutritious? And how do you know that? Where do you get your information? What are your main sources of information? And that kind of thing. I could also ask, how long have you been buying broccoli for your children? And what motivated you to do so? And was there a life event? And tell me about that. And you know, you said you were motivated by your mother. Well, well, let's talk about that a little bit. You know, what were some of the experiences you had with your mother? And, how did that encourage you to buy broccoli for your children? So a great example of having to backtrack so it's inefficient, but then ultimately getting to a whole host of questions and areas and 
ultimately the story of this participant beyond the why question. So, so that was pretty brief. Um, so in summary, I just simply want to say the why question is potentially, um, in my mind, ineffective and inefficient. We all use the why question. We will continue to use the why question. We just need to be careful in doing that. And I would just encourage all of us to be thinking about what, when, where, how, who questions um, uh, instead of uh, a why question, as well as, as Catherine has mentioned, is something to the effect of, well, tell me about a time when you felt that way, or help me understand what you are thinking of when you say that, or can you give me an example of the kind of thing that you are talking about here? You know, and when you do use the why question, because again, we all do and we all will to some effect, to some degree, um, I simply encourage you to allow sufficient time to explore the responses you get back to your why questions and be prepared to um, uh, the possibility that you may have to, what I, to backtrack, which I have just gone over, and that you may have to begin again. So that's all I've got. Um, if there's any further questions, I'd Thank be you so happy much, Margaret. That was great material, um, and I can't remember the last time I had a guest lecture that brought up broccoli and coffee makers in the same lecture, so that's awesome. Um, so we do actually have a couple more questions, um, which <laughs> I do, which is fantastic. So um, I'm going to read you some questions that we have from um, from students. I'd also just like to really chime in on that last point. I just I love this idea of, you know of how sensitive you are to making sure that you're really hearing what you need to hear and being willing to go back and backtrack and paraphrase and take a different angle at it, right? So just because we're following a discussion guide doesn't mean we have to move on. Um, you know, having that discipline to really make sure you're getting what you need before you move on is so important. Mm -hmm. um, so let me read a couple of the questions. Oh, it looks like we might have a couple more coming in too. Uh, nice. So Tom is asking, any examples about asking why people have certain feelings or attitudes about specific brands? I am starting to do brand research and want to really understand what leads to brand perceptions and why seems nice and direct. Whew, that's a big question, Margaret, but um, any, anything you'd like to share about specifically asking people why they have specific brand perceptions? Um, you know, I would go back a little bit, I think, to the example I just <laughs> used. Um, you know, I, I hate to bring up broccoli again. I don't know if we have anyone out there who just really abhors broccoli. Um, but um, uh, I think, you know, being able to relate it back to, um, to um, past experiences, to past associations, trying to get at um, participants' Uh, associations of, in this case, a brand, um, and 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 what they are. Now, it does mean that, and, and, and let me say what I, I I've said in a different way before, that, and and I don't know how this sounds, but I think we oftentimes use the why question because it's easy, and and nothing's easy, but but it's it just seems to be well, you know, it, it seems it seems easy, but. But think about it this way, which I think I've already said, which is it may be easy coming off your tongue, but it's going to be very difficult for you in teasing out what the real story is with that participant. Um, to get at the associations people have with a brand or a brand name or a particular product or service, um, you're going to um, be have to commit yourself to Going, uh, going a little bit deeper. And I will say to you, too, that forcing yourself out of that why question, I mean, just lock yourself in the room and, 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 and take yourself through the exercise of, of uh, going away from that why question. It's going to be, at least it is in my case, very insightful. Just forcing myself not to ask a why question and ask it in different ways, I find that I, um, what, what happens is that I find I learn more about ways to think about the product or service or brand that I hadn't thought about before and I hadn't thought about asking before. So it really educates, I think, the researcher in how 
um, not just to ask how to ask a question differently, but to give the researcher insight into the nuances of your 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 brand, your product, your service th that need to be um, to be talked about and uncovered. So uh, I would encourage you to go through. I would encourage all of you to, if you haven't, to go through that. Just go through that mental exercise. It's a wonderful exercise. It's very insightful. Um, and in Tom's case, again, and, and, and as part of doing that, um, you're going to be, you'll find, I think, that you're going to wind up um, asking questions about associations with the brand, associations with maybe competitive brands, associations with just the category is probably where I would start. Um, and, That's and, fantastic, and Margaret. Thank there. you so much. That was that was absolutely that great. Um, I would just add that sometimes I know, like, if I'm working on an interview guide, um, I'm pr I I sometimes in the moment, um, you know, I I always feel like oh I could be stumbling, and so sometimes in my interview guide, I'll actually have a few different probes kind of pre-scripted just so I have them in my back pocket. And so if I'm really trying to get at something like, you know, why do people have a perception of something, mm -hmm. um, I might have a few different probes kind of pre-scripted. I won't read all of them, but just kind of so I have them in that moment as a reference. Um, and we mm -hmm. have... Oh, no, I please do. do. Please share. I always have. I... Go ahead. No, no, no. I was just saying I, I always have probes in my guides. Um, I don't uh, necessarily use them because it will be because you know the context of the interview or the discussion is everything. Um, but I always have them there, and and of course some probes have to be there because there may be particular aspects of let's say a brand that if the participant you give the participant every opportunity in the world to mention it and it's something important to you and to the research question you want to have it there in your guide. So you say well you know. I haven't heard anything about blah blah blah, and you may have to give them some. Um, yeah, absolutely. That you makes you a may ton need of to sense. introduce it. If okay, it's really super. So one other question, question um, I think is interesting. Um, well, actually, we've got a couple of questions. Um, but David has asked if you could recommend any books um, about conversation and about how to listen and ask questions. Oh, that's a great question, and. Um, I think Actually, I Actually, if you don't mind, indeed. Margaret, if you have some Can book recommendations, I'd be happy to follow up with an me. email to everybody with links to the books. And of course, your, um, I want to give them also a direct link to your wonderful blog so that they can read your articles there as well. OK. Yep, absolutely. Are you, are you but so it's a hyperlink like the email you, message, um, you know what I mean? The link to the blog. <laughs> and then another question oh, okay. is, um, we have a yeah, question, sorry, is yeah, today's yeah, lecture just, applicable just, to both individual just, interviews as sure. well as focus groups? Yes. Beautiful. Absolutely. Absolutely, positively. Mm -hmm. I think everything, I, unless, you know, uh, if any of you can think of something that you do not think it's applicable, um, great. I'm happy to talk about that. But in in my discussion today, um, I am thinking Fantastic. in my head about both. IDI now I know sometimes if I am doing something where I am concerned about forced rationality or artificial rationality and responses, whether or not it's in response to a why question, but just in general, um, you know, I'll use a technique that I that many experienced qualitative researchers use, which was, if I'm asking them a question that I'm afraid is going to evoke forced and artificial rationality, I'll ask everybody in the focus group to write down their answers first, and then I'll ask them, which is just, it's just a good trick to get people to sort of stick to their guns so that they don't change mm -hmm. their answer if they hear somebody has a much more rational answer than they would. Mm. Mm -hmm. I do that, um, I do that at the end, I think of I think I'm right in saying this. I, I do this at the end of every focus group I do. And that way, um, because uh, particularly in a focus group discussion where there's just been a lot of group dynamics and people being influenced by other people and there's just been a lot of topics and issues being floating around the room um, or online. But I'm, I, what I'm talking about now is face-to-face groups. Um, uh, at the end, I really always give 
uh, participants the opportunity. And I say this to them. I say, I am now going to give you the opportunity to think for yourself. You know, we've all been kind of having a great conversation here. Now is your opportunity to think for yourself. I have one last question. This is what the question is. And I ask them to write something down in front of them. And then we kind of go around the table and I hear it. And what's great and for me, the researcher, is that I invariably hear something new which, you know, we've just spent 90 minutes on something and you think you know you know everything there is to know. Um, and then lo and behold, in that last go around, I hear something and it's great. And I will actually, I'll, and then I'll start interviewing and I'll say, well, talk to me about that. You know, it's the first time I'm hearing about that. Excellent. What a great comment, blah, blah, blah. And then we talk about that. So. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I think Margaret, I know we're, um, right we're running out of time. I want to thank you so much today, and I want to thank everybody who asked questions. We had some awesome questions come in today. This is your last call. If you have any questions, ask them now or forever hold your peace. Um, and we did have get some comments also from people who also are eager for um, any book recommendations, so that is wonderful. So I want to thank everybody for attending today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recording, and then I'm just going to close with a couple of uh,